Uh, we are delighted to have Scott the Cricket, uh, who was, uh, I guess, BS92, and then, uh, yeah, and then, that's it? Oh, yeah, I didn't bring that Stephen Gibb graduate school. Oh, awesome. Uh, and who is now an associate professor uh, in the ACC at Virginia Tech, and uh, was <laughs> nice enough to join us and to talk about his work on computer human interfaces. Great, thanks. Yeah, so I'm at that point where I'm collecting titles, so associate professor, I'm a fellow for the Institute of Creativity, Arts, and Technology which I barely fit on the line there, and a member of the Center for Human-Computer Interaction. So that's sort of the space that I, uh, that I work in there. Uh, I'll grab my speaker's privilege of, of looking back a few years. And, and I was at UNC way back then, too. There I am. I don't remember any of you. Do any of you <laughs> remember me? My, my, uh, my mom actually was at a Methodist organist at a Methodist church and a grad student over in, uh, in Hill Hall. And she talked uh, Fred Brooks's kids, or she saw this parade in and out, and, and the Citizen kids as well, way back in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s, uh, when they were doing squeaking away on the violin and the piano <laughs> and so forth, and I was not doing as much. There I am, everybody remember me from the 80s and 90s there. You can tell the 80s from those glasses. Um, that makes me look like me. And, and so yeah, I was really there. There's Sitterson Hall on, on a windy day. My little robe is blowing hard. I, I did stay in the ACC for, uh, for grad school. I went down to Georgia Tech. Um, and, and there's sort of the before and after grad school. It takes a lot out of you, as, as you know. Uh, and now I'm up at Virginia Tech. There I am. Sorting with the enemy there, the pokey bird there. Uh, try to stay connected with uh, with UNC. Um, we were nice enough to join the ACC, Virginia Tech, right when I came up. So uh, we get to have the Tar Heels come visit, and I get to get to see them and, and try to indoctrinate my kids. It's really hard in a tiny college town when they have Hokey Day and wear your Hokey wear and stuff. No, no, put on. Your Tar Heel stuff, and that doesn't go over very well. Um, I got a lot of Tar Heels in the family. There's my mom who, who uh, uh, finished up her PhD in, in music, and my dad has a, a pair of UNC degrees as well. My brother uh, and sister-in-law also have, have uh, degrees from UNC. A lot of time in Blacksburg. Um, I also spent a semester teaching in Egypt and brought my whole family and grad students and colleagues with me as well, which was uh, one of those interesting and maybe foolish things you do when you're younger than me. And I did my, my sabbatical in, in Boulder, Colorado, where the leaves turn beautiful colors as long as you think yellow is beautiful. The only tree they have out there that grows naturally are, are aspens. So, so there we are in their beautiful colors of yellow. So, so that's me. Um, in terms of the UNC influence from a professional standpoint, uh, there were three people that really helped guide me and point me in the directions that I went. One was Fred Brooks, and, and everybody knows that book, uh, Mystical Man Month, um, uh, which was very influential in sort of the software engineering side of usability engineering at HCI for me. Um, but also, how inspirational is it that just a few years ago he wrote a book in a very different area, right? So, so design of design, we really talked more about design from a creative design standpoint, which really, a lot of those re uh, lessons resonated with what I was doing then at the time. Uh, James Coggins uh, uh, did a lot of software design and is just generally an inspirational kind of guy. He, uh, been a lot of years here and, and left around 1999, I believe, to, to uh, go to a series of startups um, and other places. And Jennifer Welch, uh, I love sort of thinking about the theoretical computer science problems, and she was really wonderful about that. And, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is sort of the melding of those three things, if you can believe it. Um, so to sort of set the stage, and other people have said this, uh, uh, design of technologies is really a highly collaborative endeavor. Right? So it's not portrayed that way in the media. You know, you've got you know, Tony Stark is, you know, sits there in a big, beautiful lab we'd all like to, to, uh, to, to work in with the see-through monitors and the 
technologies lining the wall, and he's all by himself, right? He's just hacking away at whatever he's doing, and wonderful things come out of it. And you know, if you think we've moved beyond that, you know, what's the latest hot movie is the Ex Machina, and you know that guy is so isolated that you know the helicopter has to fly for like three hours to get to him. He's that, he's like the only the only person in there who's who's actually doing anything. So that's so, that's very much so disconnected from reality, right? So. So what, what is technology design really all about? It's getting lots of people together, talking to each other. And you know, especially these days, increasingly more, it's people from, from very disparate backgrounds who, who know things very well, but different things. And, and how do you get those people to communicate? How do you sort of boil down these huge knowledge bases into smaller chunks of things that people can know about? Um, uh, and then, you know, a few examples of those sorts of things in vehicle computing, which you know, we've seen a little bit about in, in some of the talks from this morning. Police and emergency response. Mobile generally, and mobile health specifically is something that I've worked in. Construction safety, notification systems, cognitive disabilities, who understands the disability, who understands the technologies that can help. And these are all things that I care about and have contributed to in various ways. So how do you share that knowledge among people? And there have been a lot of visions out there. Bush's Mimex is, is a very famous one, and Nelson Xanadu is one that's, that's, uh, that's talked about a lot. Atlas Mundanium is, is, is one of my favorite that not as many people know about. In reality, what do we do? We write those humongous papers that, that only a handful of our colleagues understand, uh, uh, cases and scenarios and use cases and patterns and, and artifacts all seek to capture that sort of knowledge and you know the possibilities, the ways that people posit we should share these things are kind of different. You know, how many people read your papers versus how many people watch that, you know, cat video or that nifty little video, blog posts are often very popular and widely read. You know, what can you capture in a, in a, in a tweet, right? 140 characters. Um, uh, and you know, it's easy to dismiss some of these, but a lot of times they're highly interlinked, right? So tweets often point you to something that's highly interesting, right? So you know, look at this neat paper that describes this, link to something. Or here's a wonderful article on this, link to something. So you have this big network of knowledge that can be very rich and interesting. Um, one of the things that I mentioned was Otlet's Mundanium. Have people heard of Otlet before? So, okay, so he was... Uh, uh, a Belgian scientist in the early part of the 20th century who had this great idea of pulling together this knowledge repository. And at the time, the technology that was actually new then was the 3 by 5 index card. And so he, he scribbled down, more than scribbled down, but he took down notes on 3 by 5 index cards and had this huge collection of them. And sometimes it was, you know, little chunks of information like this, and, and pictures like this, and, and so forth. And if you wanted a chunk of, of information that he had, you could write him a letter and include a little bit of money, and he would send you back a, an index card, or two, or three, or ten, or, or twenty, or however many of them were relevant with whatever category you said was, was interesting. So, you know, what is that? That's like Google, 1935. Right? So you Google something that takes like weeks and months to get your result back. So you, you know, you're probably a lot more careful about what you Google right, than, than you are then. And, and this actually exists now. So you can, you can go online and sort of see his, his chunk of his Google, his Google circa 1935. Uh, unfortunately, Berlin in the late 30s and early 40s is not that great a place to, to be. Even the Nazis didn't appreciate it so much. And, and moved a lot of his stuff out and moved in their own uh, uh, Nazi propaganda. So a lot of it ended up destroyed, but the part that, that, that remained actually still now exists online. If you want to, if you want to check, take a look at archives.mundanium.org. Um, <clears throat> uh, another example of capturing information and, and connections between information is Horst Riddle's idea of issue. So he thought that an issue was something that was a problem that could be captured and connected to other problems and so forth. Um, and he was working on that in the late 70s. One of his students, uh, uh, Ray McCall, uh, through the 80s, put together this, this, uh, this interface here. 
very much so has that 80s look, right? That everybody recognizes um, widget sets and so forth. Um, that primarily focused on, on architecture, although Ray is more of a technologist, so it was sort of technology in physical spaces. How do you orient things, and position cameras and monitors and lots of other things in environments? It was the plus and minus of having two projectors and the ceiling side by side and the camera there versus there and, and the screen here and, and, and how do you lay out various chunks of technology. Um, uh, and, and how do you answer these questions as a collaborative group? If you want to use this room for you know, showing off new hardware, what's the right layout? What's the right way to do that? Um, so he put together this tool. There's a tool now out there called Compendium. It's a nice open source tool that, that, that generates graphs like this. So you know, it's great for, you know, this example is you know, maintaining a data mark for, for, for grabbing distributed data and you know, there are questions that arise and ideas and pluses and minuses to those ideas and, and the pluses and minuses have raised their own questions and so forth. So you can put together this, this network of, uh, of information like that. Um, so, so that's sort of one approach. Um, and, and Riddle started a lot of that at, at Berkeley in the 60s and 70s. Around the same time, a, a concept a lot more people I think have heard of is Christopher Alexander's idea of patterns. So uh, again, an architect who was, was not so much looking for questions, but he was really looking for truths. How can we capture truths in, in patterns that then can be replicated? So here's a chunk of knowledge that is the way that you do things. Uh, and it was composed of a narrative description, a series of rules, and usually a, a, a picture or two, and then collections of related patterns. So you know, here's a way to do it, um, here's how you would go about doing that, and here's some other ways of doing that. So here's, a, here's an example, you know, if you want to have a, a road around an area, you know, here's the countryside and here's one side, and you need to have a noise shield and, and so on and so forth, and you know, there are other ways to, to have roads or paths as well. So you know, if you're interested in putting together a physical space, here's one way to do it. Um, or here's one way to do it, and here are links to other ways to do it. So you can really answer your questions from, a, from an informed perspective there. Um, so, there's, so that's an idea that was very much so adopted by, by computer scientists, right? So, so you know, this is where the idea of, of patterns and software engineering came from, really. So they adopted, there's a gang of four, four scientists who, who took that idea and put together computer science, software engineering patterns, which included similar, <coughs> not the same, but similar sets of, of, of ways of doing things there. So it was named like a builder, object creational, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve, the intent, the motivation, and then the solution, the applicability, the structure, participants, collaborations, code, etc., and then the consequences of doing it that way. So it's still kept capturing the pluses and minuses. Um, and these tended to be around 10 pages or so, and you know, there's this giant book of, of, of patterns out there. Um, it was adopted in interface design as well. Um, uh, I think they must have invented color sometime in the late 80s or so. I don't remember exactly when that came about. But here's an example of user interface patterns. You know, all these different colors that let you jump within a book or an online repository to see lots of patterns for for you know, handling customer service and, and, and putting blurbs within your, your website and so forth. So they exist for web and mobile and so forth, these, these big books and online repositories of patterns. Um, so to, to me, the idea of, of capturing truths is, is unsatisfying in a way, just because Building interfaces is so context specific that putting together something as, as, as a truth, which is, is what you see a lot in patterns, is, is hard to do. Um, and, and, and often can bring people down wrong paths. You have to understand this big pattern to sort of see how to proceed. So I, I look to a different model, the, the Stephen Toolman idea of claims. And this is the same claims that you study in, in uh, you know, 11th grade English class when you learn about argumentation and, and you have a claim and, 
and you have some data that may support it or not support it, and then you have a warrant, and you have a you know counterexample, and people remember 11th grade or freshman English or, or, or whatever it was, and man, this is really boring. And this is an example right from the book. You know, is Harry a British subject? Well, he was born in Bermuda. You know, does that mean he's a British subject? Well, you know, basically yes. If he follows all of these, unless you know he, you know, was thrown in jail and a citizen stripped and this and that and the other, and you know, no relevance to anything in the real world, right? I mean, no one would ever question the citizenship of, you know, I don't know, say, someone running for president or something, and you know, bring up all sorts of weird facts or maybe facts or so on and so forth, right? So, yeah, you got to understand claims, and then you'll. You'll understand these these sorts of things. So you know what does that have to do with with computing? Well, there was a couple of researchers up at uh, up at uh, IBM uh, digging out of the snow, I guess. Uh, uh, John and Carol and Wendy Kellogg, who wrote a, a paper with one of my favorite titles ever: "Hermeneutics Meets Theory-Based Design." So hermeneutics, sort of in the sense of doing things, versus theory. You know, all those color heads who just sit around and thinking thinking about things. How do you, you know, capture the things that people have done in a, a theoretical framework? And they looked back to the, to the tool and claim for doing that. Um, you know, put together, you know, an ID and an author and so forth, and this is one of the more structured views of this that kind of lays out the arguments that are important there. And does it say, well, you should use plan-based error messages? It kind of lays out the upsides and downsides that they're understood so that you can you can make a judgment about, yeah, that's something I want to explore more, or not. And if you want to explore it more, they sort of have pointers to the underlying theories. You know, go read the paper article or the, or the Lewis and Anderson paper or whatever it is, and you know, consider more deeply after you make an initial judgment whether this is something that, that you care about or, or not. <clears throat> so, you know, as you might guess, you end up with this network of different claims here, right? So you can you know, have a desire to prevent short uh, summaries within your website or mobile device or, or whatever it is so that people can get chunks of information quickly and easily and, and link back and forth. And that has certain upsides and downsides that, you know, might be mitigated by having video feeds or, or a series of icons so that, you know, the next billion people who don't speak English can, can understand it. And, you know, you end up with these sorts of things that you know, require some, some buy-in to, to really do and use. And y'all are probably thinking, well, he started out by saying he wants to appeal to lots and lots of people who don't want to process huge amounts of information to, to, to understand something. And, you know, you've got these big maps and, you know, three-dimensional mappings and you have to understand all the different parameters that go into this and ratings and so forth. So, you know, what, what a big mess. Show me something that really resonates with me and that I can understand and that I can show to my colleagues who understand different things, the biologists who, who uh, are going to help me build my biomedical information system or the people who understand a, a, uh, a cognitive limitations in people so that they can tell me whether an idea is good or bad would resonate with people. So, you know, this is getting into a, a, a shift that I really made, sort of going from, from the 1989 ideas that I pursued in sort of the 90s and, and early 00s um, into something that I, that I really pushed for, that really goes more to the, uh, to the design ideas that, that, uh, that Brooks pushed for. You know, how do you put forth ideas that can really resonate with people? And people look at it and they know things about it. And the way we did that was we represented the claims visually. So if you have a claim on here that has a textual representation with lots of upsides and downsides and other information, you know, pick a visual representation that really, that really grasps and resonates with that. And this is one of my favorites. So an information exhibit in, in usable engineering parlance is you know, these big displays like they're laid all over. Um, you know, buildings and airports and so on and so forth. And you know, if you want to think about how useful they are, you know, I can explain it to you and give you a description and talk about some upsides and downsides. 
or I can show you a picture like this. And you know, when you look at that, do those pe two people really look like they are enjoying themselves, like they are understanding their environment, like they are in a place where they're comfortable and, and know what's going on, or is it something where I know there was text there and then something happened and it all shifted around and you know, surely that big red block there doesn't mean my flight is canceled and, and all those other sorts of things. So we generated tons and tons of these cards, and, and this is what we really use in a lot of our classes, in a lot of sessions where we have people from, from multiple domains, is that we bring them together and have them think about different ideas, ways to put together interfaces, where we borrow from this and you know, think about how we can customize it. And you know, I want to yank this chunk of information and have it on my tablet and manipulate things around and order and organize and sort them. Um, so I talked about a lot of those different examples and actually put together a lot of the work that I did over the last uh, 10 or 12 years in, in, in a book where we really looked at the balance between showing the, this sort of information and in a sense sort of blocking this type of information, you know, if not forever, at least for a while. So once you sort of put together you know, your collection of ideas that seem promising, you know, then you know, maybe you can start bringing up some of the upsides and downsides and seeing after people have really ramped up whether or to what degree um, this is something that's interesting and useful and, 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 and so forth to people. <clears throat> so, you know, what are we looking to do now? Um, uh, we're looking to put together a lot of these claim sets for specific areas. And resonating to the morning keynote, mobile is one that, you know, yeah. are there truths to mobile right now? You know, from this morning, I, I was like, no, no, there's not. We're still figuring out a lot of this sort of stuff. A lot of people in this room are, are kind of working on the underlying algorithms so that the way that mobile works in five or 10 or 20 years is going to be very different than how it works now. So, what can we do right now? You know, put out the possibilities in a claim set like this that's going to that's going to capture and motivate people. Um, uh, accessibility is another one that, that's of, of interest to me. Um, uh, using it in a lot of classes and design meetings and so forth, and, and building online tools versus having paper cards for balancing that. Um, and in so doing, really balancing the concerns that I brought at the beginning: you know, the, the, the design, the theory, and the and the software engineering. You know, thinking about how to connect different claims together, what it means to, to connect them, uh, automating the extraction from this. Does anybody want to sit around making claim sets all the time? That sounds, that sounds hard, unless you have grad students and you can make them do it. Um, uh, but the, you know, the degree to which you can do that automatically is, 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 uh, is, is very promising. Um, and looking at how to apply the same approach to, you know, say, patterns or issues some of these other ways of, of doing things. Um, so that's what I'm up to, and, and connections to, uh, to, to UNC, and things that I really appreciate about being here. Uh, big thanks to lots of people, those PhD students that have made build claims libraries. Uh, tons of other uh, collaborators as well at, at Virginia Tech and elsewhere. Uh, uh, lots of students that, uh, that I that worked more tangentially on this. A um, handful of funding sources that I would be remiss if I didn't list that. And you know, if you like this, I'd love to talk more about it or rush out and and uh, and, and read the book. Good. All right. Take a break. We have about five minutes for questions. Yeah. Um, does any of your work uh, overlap the work that was done? It was a, it was an AI development back back as far as the 80s, as far as I know, called Psych, where they were trying to, to actually build up this, and you know, enough of a repository of, you know, logical, logical inferences and base facts, and, and some of what you described in terms of encoding mm -hmm. truth, mm -hmm. reminded me of the work that they had done in psych, uh, encyclo Encyclopedia, or Mm, cyborg, whatever psych stood for, CYC. Mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with that one, but there were a lot of those sorts of initiatives sort of through the 80s 
you know, it was the time when everyone was using computers, and I think there was a lot of hope about, you know, there is a right knowledge repository, we just got to figure out what it is. Yeah, I don't know whatever became of that, obviously not artificial yeah, intelligence. Not, yeah, I don't know if it's psych.com and we can go use it now, or if it's, you know. Or what we get, but it may be something. Yeah, that it's definitely something I, I, I you need to look into. into. Yeah, absolutely. Other questions? What? Well, I actually have one, yeah. which, was, which, which was like, you know, like you said, this kind of formal knowledge representation, right? Um, seems very useful in academic settings in which mm -hmm. you are, in fact, trying to push, you know, the state of the art and find, you know, make new knowledge discovery. So having formal methods for, for representing the knowledge you have mm -hmm. can, can be very, very convenient. But to the extent that real people use knowledge in their daily lives, it seems like most people kind of don't really bother organizing their knowledge. They mm -hmm. have a very intuitive gut kind of feel. Mm -hmm. and, and sure, that's informed by their past experiences and what they know and what they don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, but rarely, I think, do people actually kind of take the time to, to, to organize you know, their, their, their understanding of the world. Um, so to what extent do these formal methods like kind of push against our, our gut instinct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question. It's one that I've, I've wrestled with a lot. And you know, the earliest claims libraries that I've put together um, when I was even younger and more foolish than I am now, uh, we're going to be the grand solution to everything. I'm going to come up with just you know a general user interface set of claims, and I'll just grow it <coughs> indefinitely, and it will meet anyone's needs that would ever build a user interface. And you know when I built it and no one came, I you know took a step back uh, as tenure allows you to do, and and said hmm, maybe I'll do something. <coughs> A little different, and I think the answer to that lies in understanding the communities for, that would benefit from them. And I, and I throw mobile out there because I listen to the keynote and, and, and was moved to, to do that. But for me, it was really the cognitive disabilities one that, starting in 2002, is one that I think there's real potential for benefit. Number one, because you know you have technologists who often know little or nothing about cognitive disabilities, um, and you have professionals who know a lot about it, but don't know a lot of technology. So putting ideas out there that would really bridge them is an example where this sort of approach, this sort of knowledge-driven approach, where people can say, yeah, that's what my, you know, this kid that I know would really benefit from. Um, and sometimes this idea is from, oh yes, my you know, son with ADD, really likes this, okay, you know, this autistic kid who's having trouble verbalizing his, his emotions would also benefit from this. You know, these communities that don't necessarily talk, but whose knowledge can be captured and shared. So I think what's really key is finding those sorts of opportunities there, and it's not everything, it's, it's sort of selective. I, I'm not sure that you're going to have time for this, yeah. but I, I'm, I'm getting ready to model uh, something that a doctor, a client of mine uh -huh. does. Um, and wondering if you've you've got a recommendation on which track to take the, to create an expert system modeled on him. Okay. Model, modeled on all the processes and the decisions that he has to make uh -huh. with given given data in front of him. Yeah, I mean, I, I think what, so he has a way of doing things, so I think what you need to do is sort of understand his way of doing things you know, capture, either you do it or someone does it, and your does it, and okay, okay. capture, you know, capture those in, you know, these designer digestible chunks of information there, and then bringing, you know, the, the, the doctor, technologists, other stakeholders in there in a way that can, that can sort of mix together and, you know, it's not the claim sets themselves that provide the solution, but rather the fact that it's, you know, this pivot point for people to talk about things. And you know, that's not going to work if you just have a stack of professional papers in the middle of the right. of, of the table, but can if you can sort of boil it down into these into these claims, these chunks of knowledge that people can identify. Well, thank you very much, guys. That was the last speaker for our session in this room, so all the other, uh, the last remaining speakers in the other tracks are all going to be there. Come on, get out of here. <laughs> and point me in the directions that I went. One was Fred Brooks and, and 
So everybody knows that book, uh, Mystical Man Month, um, uh, which was very influential in sort of the software engineering side of usability engineering and HCI for me. Um, but also, how inspirational is it that just a few years ago, he wrote a book in a very different area, right? So, so design of design, we really talk more about design from a creative design standpoint, which really, a lot of those re uh, lessons resonated with what I was doing then at the time. Uh, James Coggins uh, uh, did a lot of software design and is just generally an inspirational kind of guy. He uh, spent a lot of years here and, and left around 1999, I believe, to, to uh, go to a series of startups um, and other places. And Jennifer Welch, uh, I love sort of thinking about the theoretical computer science problems and she was really wonderful about that. And, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is sort of the melding of those three things, if you can believe it. Um, so to sort of set the stage, and other people have said this, uh, uh, design of technologies is really a highly collaborative endeavor. Right? So it's not portrayed that way in the media. You know, you've got you know, Tony Stark is, you know, sits there in a big, beautiful lab we'd all like to, to, uh, to, to work in, with the see-through monitors and the technologies lining the wall. And he's all by himself, right? He's just hacking away at whatever he's doing, and wonderful things come out of it. And you know, if you think we've moved beyond that, you know, what's the latest top movie is the Ex Machina, and you know that guy is so isolated that you know the helicopter has to fly for like three hours to get to him. He's that he's like the only the only person in there who's who's actually doing anything. So that's that's very much so disconnected from reality, right? So so what, what is technology design really all about? It's getting lots of people together talking to each other. And you know, especially these days, increasingly more, it's people from, from very disparate backgrounds who, who know. Uh, we are delighted to have Scott the Cricket, uh, who was, uh, I guess, yes, 92, and then, uh, yeah, and then, that's it? Oh, yeah, I didn't bring that, Steve, did you have a graduate school? Oh, awesome. Uh, and who is now an associate professor uh, in the ACC at Virginia Tech, and uh, was <laughs> nice enough to join us and to talk about his work on computer-human interfaces. Great, thanks. Yeah, so I'm at that point where I'm collecting titles, so Associate Professor, I'm a fellow for the Institute of Creativity, Arts, and Technology, which I barely fit on the line there, and a member of the Center for Human-Computer Interaction. So that's sort of the space that I, uh, that I work in there. Uh, I'll grab my speaker's privilege of, of looking back a few years, and, and I was at UNC way back then, too. There I am. I don't remember any of you. Do any of you remember me? My, my, uh, my mom actually was at a Methodist organist at a Methodist church and a grad student over in, uh, in Hill Hall. And she talked uh, Fred Brooks's kids, or she saw them parade in and out, and, and the Citizen kids as well, way back in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, when they were doing squeaking away on the violin and the piano and so forth, and I was not doing as much. There I am. Everybody remember me from the 80s and 90s there. You can tell the 80s from those glasses. Um, that makes me look like me. And, and see, so, yeah, I was really there. There's Citizen Hall on, on a windy day. My little road is blowing hard. I, I did stay in the ACC for, uh, for grad school. I went down to Georgia Tech. Um, and, and there's sort of the before and after grad school takes a lot out of you, as, as you know. Uh, and now I'm up at Virginia Tech. There I am, sorting with the enemy there, the, the pokey bird there. Uh, try to stay connected with, uh, with UNC. Um, we were nice enough to join the ACC, Virginia Tech, right when I came up. So uh, we get to have the Tar Heels come visit, and I get to, get to see them and, and try to indoctrinate my kids really hard in a tiny college town when they have hokey day and wear your hokey wear and stuff. No, no, put on your Tar Heel stuff. And that doesn't go over very well. Um, I got a lot of Tar Heels in the family. There's my mom who, who uh, uh, finished up her PhD in, in music and my dad has a, a pair of UNC degrees as well. My brother uh, and sister-in-law also have, have uh, degrees from UNC. A lot of time in Blacksburg. Um, I also spent a semester teaching in Egypt and brought my whole family and grad students and colleagues with me. 
as well, which was uh, one of those interesting and maybe foolish things to do when you're younger than me. And I did my, my sabbatical in, in Boulder, Colorado, where the leaves turn beautiful colors as long as you think yellow is beautiful. The only tree they have out there grows naturally are, are aspens. So, so there we are in their beautiful colors of yellow. So, so that's me. Um, in terms of the UNC influence from a professional standpoint, uh, there were three people that really helped guide me 